Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the Royal Society of Tasmania Northern Branch 2020 monthly lecture series. My name's Frank Medill. I'm the president of the branch and have much pleasure in introducing our presentation today. Due to the restrictions and risk caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, these are being delivered as webinars via the Zoom technology. I hope you're all comfortable with Zoom and feel free to use the Q&A button if you have any questions. We'll endeavour to answer these at the end of each section. The title of today's presentation is Breaking New Ground. As the branch we have done in previous years as part of National Science Week, we have invited three University of Tasmania PhD candidates to present a synopsis of their work. Each of their presentations cover topics that have relevance to our current and future way of life here in Tasmania. Our first presentation is from Yui Tran, a pharmacy PhD candidate, investigating the cause of insulin resistance in type 2 diabetes mellitus. Her project aims to determine whether the abnormal accumulation of toxic fats in skeletal muscle contributes to the elevation of glucose levels. We finds will offer a novel prospective biomarker to predict the incidence of insulin resistance in current diabetic epidemic. Thanks, Frank, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yu. Thank you for coming along. Today, I'm going to talk about some research outcomes from my PhD project, which requires a collaboration between the School of Pharmacy and Pharmacology in Hobart and the School of Health Science in Launceston. My research project aims to review the incident of diabetes, which is a serious complex condition which can affect the entire body. When someone has diabetes, the body can maintain healthy levels of glucose in the blood. Glucose is a form of sugar, which is the main source of energy for our bodies. Unhealthy levels of glucose in the blood can lead to long-term and short-term health complications. For our body to work properly, we need to convert glucose, sugar from food into energy. A hormone called insulin is essential for the conversion of um, glucose into energy. In people with diabetes, insulin is no longer produced or not produced in sufficient amounts by the body. While there is currently no cure for diabetes, you can live an enjoyable life by learning about the condition and effectively managing it. However, we know diabetes, specifically type 2 diabetes, is the leading cause of blindness in working age adults is the leading cause of kidney failure and dialysis, increasing the risk of heart attacks and stroke by up to four times. It is a major cause of limb amputations, affects mental health as well as physical health. Depression, anxiety, and distress occur in more than 30% of all people with diabetes. And why type 2 diabetes is increasing these days? Because Obesity rates are increasing all around the world. Type 2 diabetes is one of the major consequences of the obesity epidemic. The combination of muscle changes to the diet and the food supply combined with muscle changes to physical activity with more sedentary work and less activity means most population are seeing more type 2 diabetes. On over the world, more than 400 million people have diabetes, and did it is back to, to double in the next 20 years. And how about in Australia? Every five minutes, an Australian di is diagnosed with diabetes. And around 85 to 90 percent of all diabetes cases is type 2 diabetes, which is accounted for almost 2 million Australians having diabetes. And this is the major concern in Tasmania, where 60% of the population is overweight and prone to develop type 2 diabetes. Management of type 2 diabetes includes lifestyle modifications, 
as the first step for the treatment program. For example, weight loss in obese patients exercise regularly and consume healthy diet. And if patients do not achieve treatment target in lowering blood glucose level by lifestyle modification, they need to start using drugs. There are several drugs for type 2 diabetes, but because diabetes is progressive, multiple factorial, and requires lifelong management, sadly, there's no definite cure for diabetes until now. So there is a need to develop additional intervention and better drugs for type 2 diabetes. Diabetes is characterized by a high blood glucose concentration caused by a deficient secretion of insulin, insulin resistant, or combination of the two. So now I'm going to explain to you how insulin resistant happens. After meal, blood sugar level is increased, which promotes insulin secretion from pancreas. When insulin binds to its receptor in target cells, several signal transduction cascade happens to allow sugar to be uptaken into the cells. Therefore, sugar level between the blood and the target cells is balanced. You are healthy in this stage. There are several target tissues for insulin, such as liver, fat tissue, skeletal muscle. Here in my study, I focus mainly on skeletal muscle because it is the main tissue responsible for more than 70% of insulin-stimulated glucose uptake. In type 2 diabetes, the cells become resistant to insulin and ignore the message to uptake glucose. This is known as insulin resistance. Insulin resistance reduces the glucose uptake into the cell, so it leads to a high level of sugar in the blood as insulin resistance develops. Your body fights back by, pro by producing more insulin. Over months and years, the pancreas that are working so hard to make insulin becomes tired and can no longer keep pace with the demand for more and more insulin. Then, years after insulin resistance silently began, your blood sugar level begins to rise, and you may develop prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. The driving forces behind insulin resistance include excess fat accumulation, lack of exercise, smoking, and even sleep deprivation. As I just explained, insulin resistance plays an important role in the development of type 2 diabetes. Therefore, um, reducing insulin resistance is a therapeutic target for type 2 diabetes. So it is important to find out substances called insulin resistance. It's well known that a saturated fat called bimetic acid is toxic and is correlated with the development of insulin resistance in muscle cells. There are also other fats which may be more toxic than bimetic acids. So it is important to study other fats that can cause insulin resistance in muscle cells. Recently, there is an emerging of a special fat called one deoxys fingolipids. For shorter, I will call it DSL. In one study of Othman, he and his research group measure the plasma level of DSL in 339 patients and discover that, firstly, DSL level was elevated in patients with impaired fasting glucose, metabolic syndrome, and in non-diabetic individuals who later on developed diabetes. These findings suggested that the SL were already elevated in an early phase of type 2 diabetes in a symptomatic population. Secondly, the amount of the SL in the blood of type 2 diabetes patients were also increased, indicating that the SL is a novel biomarker of type 2 diabetes. Importantly, the SL also possesses cytotoxic properties to some types of cells, such as pancreatic cells, and nerve cells. These findings further support the notion that the SL are not only early biomarkers of type 2 diabetes, but also may be involved in the development of type 2 diabetes. At the moment, there is no study about the effect of the SL on muscle cell. The most important one in the development of insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes, and no information about the relationship between the SL muscle cell, insulin resistance, and type 2 diabetes. Therefore, 
these evidences lead me to raise a hypothesis that whether DSL induces cell toxicity, insulin resistance in skeletal muscle, and triggers type 2 diabetes. And how I can address my hypothesis? Cell culture work to determine how DSL affects the functionality and metabolism of skeletal muscle cells. Generally, I culture my skeletal muscle cell, then introduce non-toxic sphingolipid as a control and DSL as a treatment. The results um, from the test on the right hand side will help me to answer if DSL causes insulin resistance on muscle cell. And now let's see the exciting results. My results show that the cell is not happy at all. Look at how sad the cell is. The reason is because the SL have toxic effect on them. Firstly, the SL reduce significantly the number of alive cells. The cell could not grow and divide well, so there were less cells in the SL treatment. In addition, the SL induced energy deficits by reducing energy production inside the cells. And especially, I also discovered that the SL induced cell death And the most important findings of my project is, in the presence of insulin, the cell uptake leuco 15% less than the control group, control group, which confirmed that the SL triggered insulin resistance by impairing insulin-stimulated leuco uptake on muscle cells. Okay, now let us summarize my results. The SL shows cytotoxic effect that may trigger insulin resistance in muscle cells because DSL reduce a life cell number, induce energy deficits by reducing energy production, cause cell death, and especially inhibited the insulin stimulated glucose uptake. In conclusion, our project is very important because for the first time, we may explain the role of DSL in type 2 diabetes. And this may open the new direction for the treatment of insulin resistance and for the prevention of type 2 diabetes. And this is my most first slide for my talk. Okay, now let I introduce you my lovely supervisory team, Bunny Caruso from the School of Pharmacy and Pharmacology in Hobart, Sabrina Sonda, Raj Airy, and Darren Henstrick from the School of Health Science. And I would like to take this chance to acknowledge School of Pharmacy and Pharmacology and School of Health Science, and all of my colleagues who involved in this project, Steve Meyer, Courtney, Cameron, Isaac, John, and Parisa, and especially to the funding body, Health and Medical Research Leadership Development Program. And this brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lee. A very, very interesting uh, uh, testing of this particular substance. And we have a question. Uh, if you're able to uh, answer it, is DSL naturally occurring? And uh, if so, what substance does it occur in? Uh, can you clarify your, your questions, Frank? Where, where, where would one find DSL uh, in, in the body uh, or anywhere else for that matter, but in the, in the body, what part of the body uh, yes. um, is, do we find DSL? I think that's what the question is asking. Okay, uh, as I mentioned in my slide, because uh, previous study, they recognize DSL exists in the blood. Um, they measure the DSL level in the blood of the patient with uh, prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. And they recognize that the level of DSL increase significantly. So it's from the blood. Yeah, and they also mentioned um, DSL have toxic effect to muscle cell, to nerve cell and to pancreatic beta cell. Fine, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation, Lee. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, everyone. Our next presenter is attached to the Australian Research Council Training Centre for Innovative Horticultural Products. Indica Fernando's research is focused on understanding the compound forces that create fruit damage during the lengthy road trips 
from tropical areas where they are grown to major markets in the south. He is using an experimental approach to help industry deliver the perfect banana. Oh, I like to hear that. I love my bananas and in good condition. <laughs> so here is Indica telling us about a bumpy ride to perfect fruits. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, today I'm going to share with you um, a part of my PhD project titled Bumpy Road to Perfect Fruits. Now, if, if you, you are given the opportunity to choose a banana, which are priced the same, I'm sure you might go for the one that looks better and with less damage. Through past research and studies, it has been found that damages which lead to cosmetic imperfections cause the industry a significant amount of losses uh, by wastage and also reduce quality uh, in the retail markets. So my project can be simply explained in four W's. That is, why these damages occur, what are these damages, and how can we minimize these damages? So if I give you a bit of a background uh, to bananas, it is one of the major fruit crops in the world with a production of over 100 million tons in 2013. And it is the largest horticulture industry in Australia with a farm gate value of 600 million Australian dollars. Previous research found out that about 30% of bananas are discarded in the pack houses alone just because they are not looking good and they are consisting damages. And the cosmetic defects amount the industry around $33 million per annum, Australian dollars per annum. And one interesting fact about bananas is that 95% of this fruit is grown in the state of uh, Queensland, in the area of Northern Queensland. It is this area that uh, we are referring to. Uh, this is called the Cairns and Tully region, which results in extremely lengthy supply chains down the continent to major markets such as Melbourne, Sydney, and Brisbane, which exposes this fruit to enormous amounts of vibration, shocks, compression, etc which results in mechanical damage, especially when they are packaged. And these damages are only discovered when the packages are opened uh, for sale in the retail markets. This makes it difficult to understand why, when, and where these damages occurred along the supply chain. So when it comes to defects in packaged fruits, there are many causes other than mechanical damage. But in my project, I focused on mechanical damage and today I'm going to focus on vibration induced mechanical damage which can cause different types of damages in packaged fruits specifically for bananas like bruising, fruit rub, black and rub, scuffing and neck injuries. So to understand mechanical damage due to vibration there were three stages in my project. First to evaluate these damage levels and characterize the field damage, replicate the damage levels in the laboratory so that we can understand these damages and finally to reduce damages through solutions testing. When it comes to characterizing mechanical damages, we loaded a B double truck. This is a type of a truck they used for transporting bananas from these tropical regions throughout Australia um, to, to, to other, other, other states uh, and also for the major markets. So we loaded this truck with 32 pallets of bananas, which is the full capacity. Um, and it had air ride suspension and we conducted different trial runs uh, from Tully region in Queensland to Melbourne in Victoria to understand the vibration damage and also to uh, record uh, vibration levels along the route so that we can understand and characterize the damages caused by vibration and shocks. When we had a look at the initial damage levels and also after transport, we could see that there is clearly an impact of vibration and there are different types of damages. For example, you can see here fruit crop is developing in bananas. 
to quantify vibration and shocks in transit, we used custom-built sensors. So these sensors are capable of uh, detecting and recording three-axis acceleration at very high frequency levels. Uh, so we use 400 hertz uh, for, for the recording of vibration, three axis that gives us uh, 1,200 readings in X, Y, Z uh, axis per second. And also these records shocks with GPS coordinates, timestamp, and also the temperature, humidity, and uh, other important variables. So when it comes to damage levels, we understood that there is uh, a high level of damage in the bottom tiers of the pallet, that is the tier one of the pallet, and high levels, much higher levels of damage in the tier 10 of the pallet. But there's very less damage levels in the middle of the pallet, the middle tier. So if I, uh, I have a representative icon of a pallet here, when you go up towards the pallet, the damage levels are getting higher. When you go down towards the bottom of the pallet, the damage levels are getting higher. So this was a bit of a mystery at first we had to solve. Uh, by understanding how vibration transmits through packages which might result in uh, these various variations of damage in different tiers. So this graph uh, gives the vibration energy levels with respect to frequency for the different positions of the truck. As you can see, these uh, positions marked, with, marked in red uh, these positions had higher energy levels and also higher damage levels in bananas. And as you can see in the graph, in the low frequency range of the graph, there's much higher vibration energy in these positions, which corresponded with the damage levels uh, during the assessment of bananas after transport. So one of the major challenges in my project was to understand how to simulate this damage inside a laboratory so that we can recreate these damages and also understand these damages uh, and also do solutions testing in the later stages. But one of the key challenges is how to simulate an 86 hour uh, road trip inside a laboratory because if you're going to use all 86 hours for the replication studies, each test has to be 86 hours, which is not practical. So we do in order to reduce simulation test time, we use these uh, methods called accelerated simulation testing and also damage rate curves. So what you see here is the cube with respect to uh, the duration and also the RMS acceleration, that is root mean square acceleration. So this cube presents the damage levels with respect to different treatments and we could identify a treatment which reasonably replicated the damage levels inside the laboratory so that we can use it for later solutions testing. So for example, this is a transport vibration simulator and I'm gonna play this video so that you can see how we simulated these vibration levels inside the laboratory. So when we give the vibration profile as an input, this would simulate the road vibration levels which occurred in uh, in, in during the transport inside laboratory and we stack a full stack of bananas for testing so that we can understand how this vibration is transmitted and also causing different types of damages. For example, we try to identify what happens uh, with respect to vibration transmissibility in different tiers. As you can see, uh, this purple color li uh, line shows the vibration level in, in, in the uh, lower frequency in the top tiers of the pallet, as you can see, there is resonance that is occurring. You can see from the dashed line, it is the input vibration of the table, and uh, the purple line shows the resonance that occurred around 8 hertz and also uh, around uh, between 10 to 20 hertz. Um, so, if you focus on the gray line, it shows the vibration transmissibility in the bottom tier of the stack, the bottom package. Um, this shows the high frequency vibration is the major cause of damage uh, in the bottom tiers, whereas the low frequency high energy resonance uh, vibration was the, uh, the reason for damage in the, uh, in the top tiers of the pallet. For example, we use these vibration profiles which were developed uh, through field data to understand uh, 
the possibility of reducing damage in different types of packaging, including reusable plastic crates. Uh, and we identified different combinations of stacking, like stacking arrangements, um, so that we can understand how these different stacking arrangements can reduce these damage levels uh, and also protect vibration damage to bananas. And we also conducted further research on damping, uh, which is these, these damping solutions are a point isolated damp damping uh, rubber mats, sort of a polymer rubber mat. These are used to understand whether these have the potential of reducing the transmissibility of vibration. And we found out that this works much better uh, to reduce vibration in the high frequency range, but not in the lower frequency range. Uh, so we might have to couple this solution with uh, spring systems so that we can reduce this transmissibility in the lower frequency range, which cause damage uh, to bananas in the future. So with that, I conclude my presentation and I thank the RC Training Center of Australian Horticultural Products and my industry partners uh, for making this project possible. Thank you and over to you, Frank. Thank you very much, Indica. There you are. <laughs> Experiment with bananas. I think it's marvelous because we all want to get the best bananas down here. It's a long way. And uh, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, are bananas at the bottom of the stacks more likely to be damaged than the top? I think you uh, might have answered this in your production, but you might just summarize it for us, please, Indica. Um, yes, thanks for the question, Frank. Uh, if you if you are talking about like as I mentioned, there are different types of damages caused by compression, vibration, and shocks. If you talk about vibration damage, yes, it's getting higher towards the bottom of the pallet and higher towards the top of the pallet. Yes, they are getting they are getting worse due to the transmissibility uh, of different the vibration in different re frequency ranges. For example, bottom of the pallet, the damage is mostly caused by the transmission of high frequency vibration, maybe more than 30 to 100 hertz, 30, between 30 to 100 hertz. Right, thank you. Um, then another question, uh, why aren't bananas sent by sea within Australia? And what would be the difference if they were? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think uh, right now they are throughout Australia, it's transported by road. Um, and it's, it's, I'm not sure, we, we tried to try uh, whether we can transport bananas by, by, by boats and by sea, but uh, it de depends on the volumes and also if, if there's enough bananas to fill, 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 <laughs> fill a ship. Uh, so yes, I think uh, Shipping Australia Limited is working on uh, that aspect, but for the moment, they're not transported by sea. Thank you. Another question. In assessing damage to the bananas, did you look inside the banana or just judge it from the outside? Right. Thank, thank you for that. That's a good question. Uh, so when, when it comes to damages, if you get bruising, uh, it, has, it, it, it can penetrate to the flesh. But when it comes to uh, surface damages like rubs and scuffing, that's only uh, that's only superficial and that's only on the uh, that that's limited to the peel so specifically for vibration damage no but uh, for other experiments regarding compression bruising uh, and damages caused by shocks yes i had a look at uh, the flesh as well very good thanks indigo somebody has asked us if you did the simulations here in tasmania how did you get undamaged bananas here to experiment with so unfortunately, we don't have transport vibration simulators in the Tasmania that I know of. Uh, these experiments were conducted in 2017, uh, summer 17 to 19. Um, so I had to use uh, simulators in the mainland. Uh, we didn't transport bananas um, to Tasmania to do this experiment. Uh, and to do the experiments to get the undamaged bananas, what we usually do is we use extra like bubble wrapping and packaging to get good bananas to Melbourne, uh, use extra protective layers and do an examination run before the experiments to make sure that there are no damages. And then uh, after the experiment, you assess the damage. There you get the difference. That's the level of damage occurred due to vibration. Fine. And uh, look, I, I've got to ask this question, Indica. 
after you finish the experiment, who gets to eat the bananas? <laughs> not me, not me, Frank. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so we gave away uh, nearly four tons of bananas. We used for, uh, yeah, ne nearly three tons of bananas we used for these experiments. Uh, they were all given away as charity to uh, the food bank in Melbourne. Well, if you, uh, if you do bring the experiment down to Tasmania and to Launceston and you need an assistant uh, uh, with the bananas, you could give me a call. I love bananas. <laughs> Thank you very much, Indiga. Thank you Thank for you very a very, much. very interesting presentation indeed. Thank you. Our next presenter is Christelle August. She's our third PhD candidate and she has a passion for renewable energy and the ocean. Her research at the Australian Maritime College focuses on how tidal turbines could influence sediment transport in high energy sites. The aim of her PhD is to assess the sediment dynamics at tidal energy sites in Australia and predict the environmental response to the extraction of energy. Christelle has titled her presentation, Tidal Energy is Coming to Tasmania. Hi Frank and thanks uh, for introducing me. I'm going to show you and talk about tidal energy today. So let's start. So imagine a life without energy, no light no heat, no cooking, no commuting. Your way of life is defined by energy. With climate change, we need to develop cleaner and sustainable way to produce energy. And you know what? Ocean, who covers 71% of the planet, is an amazing uh, source of power. Tidal energy is one of the most uh, advanced renewable marine energy. The economic potential of tidal resources is reliable when compared to other types of renewable energy like wind or solar, as the tide have the advantages of being highly predictable. Tidal energy can become a great contributor to the energy industry and the global potential is worldwide. As you can see in this map, the biggest potential are in Canada, following by UK and then uh, in Australia. There are different technology for the design of the turbine. At the top, I'm showing you some uh, seabed mounted turbine with different shape. And at the bottom, it's a floating turbine which is in development with the society orbital. Uh, there are several projects uh, already grid connected in Europe. Uh, and I'm going to show you one. So let's go to Scotland where the company CIMEC Atlantis um, have, has installed four turbines of 18 meters diameter uh, in the north of Scotland. So each, each turbine is um, installed with an individual foundation with a weight of 200 tons and with six ballast blocks uh, to provide horizontal stability. Last year, they produced 14 gigawatt water, which is the equivalent of around 4,000 UK household. And this year, they reach uh, 28. So it's very promising. So tidal energy is very active in Europe and it's coming to Australia. So in Australia, according to preliminary study uh, done by the CSRO, there exists some uh, promising site where tidal installation is possible. It's in Western Australia with the King Sound. Uh, it's near Darwin with the Clarence Strait and is in Tasmania with the Bank Strait, which is located uh, between Musselwell Bay and Clark Island. So my project focuses on this. And the Austin project, with a project confounded by ARENA, is also interested in this site. And this project aims to map tidal resources in Australia and assess its economic feasibility. So people in industry are interested by this site and they need to understand all the characteristics in this environment. And one parameter is sediment transport. 
So why sediment? Uh, sediment in the ocean can be moved by wave or current and very often by both. A sediment is set in a motion when the lift and the drag component are greater than the gravitational and the friction forces. Once the particles are in motion, two modes of transport uh, are distinguished. The first one is a bed load transport who occur near the seabed where the mobile load is close to the bed. And the other one is a suspended load, the load who is no longer in contact with the seafloor. Friction between the near seabed current and the seafloor creates a layer of shear and increased turbulence above the seabed. It's called the, bonder, the bottom boundary layer. This is the layer where uh, the most influence by the seafloor. The effect of current and waves on sediment dynamics take place in this layer. And the friction that exists uh, on the seafloor is expressed with the bed shear stress. The bed shear stress is a principal parameter acting on sediment dynamics. It's function of the square velocity. The sediment transport is function of current speed power three or four. So small changes in current speed or bed shear stress could lead to large changes in sediment dynamics. Sediments play a crucial role in coastal ecosystems. They are responsible for the dynamics of sand banks. The sediment influences morphodynamics, erosion, accretion, and sediment influences offshore and underwater structure. Tidal energy is a clean technology and it will help to reduce reliance on fossil fuel, but it still faces challenges. Which one? uncertainty about interaction of turbine with the environment. Second one, limited full-scale environmental survey as it's still at early stage of development. And the third one is a difficulty to acquire data to calibrate and validate numerical model. And you can see why it's pretty rough condition over there. So this picture was taken during our first field trip in the Bang Strait in March 2018. We went over there for 17 days and the weather was like this during 10 days. So I was pretty seasick during this first campaign. So to address these challenges, uh, I'm developing numerical model to investigate hydrodynamics and sediment transport in Bang Strait. And to validate the model, we need in situ data. That's why with the Austin project, uh, three field trips have been connected in 2018 and one last year. And for this, we use a large set of instruments. So the first one you can see is an ADCP, uh, ADCP acoustic Doppler current profiler, who measures the current speed, the velocity. In the middle with a rocket ship, is a penetrometer to measure the strength of the flow. Then the sediment traps have designed with the uh, help of the technician team in IMC to have information about the grain size distribution. <clears throat> At the bottom, it's an optical sensor with a laser to have information about the particle size distribution. <clears throat> in the middle, it's a sub-bottom profiler to characterize the seabed. And the last one is that another instrument to have information about the grain size uh, distribution. We also map uh, uh, the area with a multibeam. So you can see in the corner in the right, uh, to have precise bathymetry, we use a multibeam a sonar uh, to have accurate bathymetry in this strait. And on this map, you can see also all the stations where the instrument for measure um, the current speed are located. So everyone, every instrument is looking up to um, register all the current speed in the water column. And there is only one called box from here in the middle. We, we have installed this one looking down to have insight uh, for the current speed uh, near the seabed, which is important for uh, the, near the, the sediment transport. With the multi-beam, we also uh, discover some tidal sand dunes just uh, south of Clark Island. So it's very interesting for the sediment transport. With all the instruments to have information about the grain size distribution, 
we had a process map uh, of the seabed in Bong Strait. So in the middle of the channel, we can see it's pretty rocky and uh, it's more quiescent except for Swan Island where it's medium sand. We had an, uh, the last uh, instrument was a sub-bottom profiler. So we did a comparison between uh, the multi-beam who was um, collected data in March and the sub-bottom profiler in December, so nine months apart. And here we just extracted two profiles south of Clark Island. So the first profile is a bathymetry with a red line and the red line is a sub-bottom profiler, we just overlap. And you can see there is a migration of the sand dunes, which is most obvious on this one. So the dunes are, are moving and we need to understand what would be the influence if we put a tidal farm near this area. So that's why uh, I'm creating numerical model. This is um, my domain. And with this, I'm able to understand better the hydrodynamics and, for example, to know uh, the current speed and the maximum current speed in this area. So the maximum uh, speed are in the, located in the center of the strait, and the maximum is above 2.4 meter by second. The next step was to include turbine in the model. Here I uh, included two tidal farms, one of 100 turbine and one of 300 turbine, and I tested the model in 2D and in 3D. So 2D at the top and 3D at the bottom. Uh, you can see for the first farm in 2D, the influence is not significant. The spatial extent does not go beyond five kilometers. It's more two kilometers of influence for the change in the current speed. But for uh, the 300 turbine, it's another story. Uh, the change in the current speed go beyond five and it's more seven kilometers. And it's also near uh, the tidal sand dunes south of Clark Island. So it was quite the same for the depth of average velocity in 2D and in 3D. Then I had a, another look in the water column uh, at the location of the farm in 3D to know where was the layer who was the most uh, impacted. And this is uh, the layer where the rotor is. It's called like the hub height. And this is uh, the layer where there is the most change. Then uh, after looking at the change in the current speed, I had a look uh, on the bed shear stress. So for the bed shear stress, I just did uh, another pro extracted a profile uh, south of Clark Island near the sand dunes to see the difference between the farm and between 2D and 3D. And this is right now what I'm doing. And I'm trying to reproduce the migration uh, first without tidal farm of the sand dunes. And then after I could uh, understand what will be the influence of tidal farm. So this project will provide uh, specific data for uh, this site and will help to the community to better understand uh, the influence of turbine and tidal farm in this type of a very energetic environment. And maybe like this in the future, we could be part of the blue economy and have a tidal farm in Bank Strait. This is our future. Thanks for your attention and uh, back to you, Frank. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very, very much, Christelle. <clears throat> very, very interesting. And uh, the question is, <clears throat> pardon me, when do you think this might come on as a commercial proposition to feed power into the Australian grid? So for Australia, there is still a lot of um, challenges. So I think uh, maybe in, if I was like very optimistic, maybe in 10 years, it would be perfect to have maybe a tidal farm in Bank Strait. And maybe it will be like uh, happening more often in more easily in Darwin. I don't know, we'll see. We have, uh, actually I'm working on Bank Strait, but I have another colleague who is working on the Clown Strait in Darwin. So we are just doing some tests and some analysis. So we will know a lot more uh, at the end of this year. Thank you. And uh, I've got a question. Um, 
is there any possibility of using the current in the Tamer River? We've got a strong flow uh, and a high tide uh, height in the Tamer River. Um, is there any possibility that uh, turbo power could be could be harnessed there? So Maco uh, Maco Turbine, uh, Australian company, did some tests at the Baldman Bridge. And it was pretty convincing, but I don't know why it didn't um, pursue. Uh, there is a lot of sediment in the Tamar estuary too. So that could be one of challenges which would be very difficult. So, but who knows, I, I can uh, dig a little bit more and uh, come back later to you to answer this. The, uh, the question, uh, another question that, um I presume it re relates to bank straight. Is the current unidirectional, or is it switch around? No, switch around. So the 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 water is go this way, the other way, and the turbine can face the current all the time. Uh huh. And uh, is the uh, um, is the tidal range important in deciding where you would t uh, try a tidal farm? So there is two ways. You can have a huge tandem range. That's why in the Western Australia and uh, near Derby, we have the highest tide in Australia. It's a very good site. Or you can have a very tidal, uh, strong current. And in Bong Strait, we don't have a huge tidal range, but as is constrained between the main of, uh, mainland of Tasmania and the little island, there is a constriction. And so the flow is accelerated. And that's why we have strong current over there. And this is very promising for tidal energy. Thank you. And uh, one of the viewers would like to know, how much does a single turbine cost? Oh, that's a really good question. I don't know. <laughs> But yeah, I can, I can, uh, I can, uh, I can ask and come back to you. But yeah, that's a really nice one. I don't know. And uh, I, uh, last question: um, Is it possible that the change in the amount of sedimentation or the movement in the se sedimentation would be uh, a showstopper for this technology? Um, yes. Yeah. So, what if sort of so level of change would be? What sort of level of change would be acceptable? So we tr there is like no guideline for now. So we try to first, uh, if this change is quite similar to the natural variability, it's acceptable. I think if it's like 5% more, it would, it would not be, it would not be yeah, very nice. So, but it would be uh, analyzed by the regulators and like the government to see, are you okay or are you not okay with this? So that's why env environmental impact and influence are very important. And we need to do this at the first time, at the first, uh, for the first preliminary, preliminary assessment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christelle. The Thanks, telling us about how tidal energy will come to Tasmania and uh, I think we should thank all three of our PhD candidate presenters today. It's been three fascinating presentations from three very clearly three very talented young people who were good enough to come along and make a special presentation of our National Science Week event. Uh, we wish you all three of you the very best of luck in the future, the greatest success, uh, and thank you very, very much for being part of our presentation today. Next month's presentation will be given on the 27th of September by Professor Michael Breadmore. He will tell us about chemical changes, chemical answers rather now, chemical answers now, protecting us and our environment, a subject about which we're all, I think, very passionate and very concerned. Next year is the 100 year anniversary of the Northern Branch of the Royal Society here in Tasmania. And we will have some special events to commemorate our 100 year birthday. So please watch our website for details of those events. We've also got the 2021 Royal Society calendar is now available. Very handsome calendar, makes a wonderful gift. So you know, get in early, make sure that you get uh, your copy and uh, one for a friend 
uh, and uh, support the Royal Society as well as have a look at a beautiful calendar. That concludes our webinar today. We hope that you've enjoyed it. We've enjoyed bringing it to you. And between now and next time, we wish you well, be careful, be safe, and goodbye.